come into this place and offer our prayers to him at this time. Let us pray together. Almighty God, as we stand in awe of your goodness and mercy today, we invite you to be present amongst us by the power of your Holy Spirit. Father, we declare that we love you. Thank you that you've made the way of love known through your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray that you reveal this great love to all of us today as we gather to worship. Lead us by your Spirit to praise you, and may our hearts overflow with thanksgiving and our mouths proclaim your everlasting greatness. Continue to walk beside us as we continue our Lenten journey and seek to improve our relationship with you in a great way. In the wonderful name of Jesus, we ask all of this. Amen. His word. And our Old Testament reading this morning is from the book of Numbers, chapter 21, verses 4 through 9. They traveled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Adam. But the people grew impatient on the way, and they spoke against God and against Moses, and said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There's no bread. There's no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them, and they bit the people, and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord would take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look up at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and he put it up on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, they lived. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Lord, this morning you've heard the people that are out this morning, the spoken, the unspoken requests, those that are sick, those that are missing this morning, Lord, we pray for them. We hope they're not sick, and maybe the clocks are gone bad, and they forgot to get up this morning. But Lord, if they're sick, we ask you to heal them, and give them, bring them back to us. Lord, this morning, pray for the people in Texas this morning. Texas has been catching the devil all went along, Lord. We ask you to be with them and protect them in any way that you can, Lord. Lord, again this morning, I pray for our firefighters, our police officers, our doctors and nurses, and especially our military. We ask you to guide us through everything we do and say. We ask you to be with us through this day and through this week. And for those that are traveling today, Lord, we ask you a special prayer. Lord, we pray. Amen. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say this, those he redeemed from the hand of the foe, those he gathered from the lands, from east and west, from north and south. Some became fools through their rebellious ways and suffered affliction because of their iniquities. They loathed all food and drew near the gates of death. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He set forth his word and healed them. He rescued them from the grave. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for men. Let them sacrifice, let them sac sacrifice thank offerings and tell of his works with joy the song. Excuse me, with songs of joy. Others went out on the sea in ships. They were merchants on the mighty waters. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Giving God thanks and praise for his gifts to our fellowship here, let us sing on the hymn of the doxology. Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, 
And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This morning as we come to God's table, reflect back upon the past week. If there's anything that needs to be addressed between you and God during this time of singing of the hymn, the meditation as the elements are passed, this is a great time just to speak quietly with Him. He's always faithful and just to forgive us that we may partake worthily and with a clean heart. Our communion hymn this morning is number 195, When I Survey the Wonders Cross. Passover meal, unleavened bread, a symbol of remembrance. 
Moses for the escape from Egypt but by the Israelites. And he took the unleavened bread and he blessed it. He broke it. And then he gave it to the disciples. And he gave a special meaning when he just said, this is my body. Eat and remember the baby. Peace of the Lord be always with you. Let us turn a path of peace. It's no good to see each one of you this morning. <laughs>
morning scripture reading from the gospel is from the book of John, very familiar passage to all of us, John chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in Him. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they've not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love the darkness instead of the light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light, and they'll not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth that comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been in the sight of God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord, speak to our hearts now as we study a portion of your scripture that you have left for our edification. Lord, may we grow from it. The things that we listen to today, from the hymns to the prayers, may this all come together to help to build our faith life, to make us a stronger Christian for you. As we go out into the world this week, we'll encounter many people who have a need in their life, who are seeking answers. Father, may we be the one to cross their paths and to share some comfort, peace, and love of God with them. Speak now, O Lord, for your servants listen. And all of God's children said, Amen. Well, John 3.16 appears in a lot of places, and most commonly a quote of the text is just a citation of the gospel, chapter and verse. Just the name John, followed by the number 3, a colon, and the number 16. You'll see it on placards at sports events. You'll see it at political rallies. You'll see it on signs that people post in their front yards and inside the bottom rim of some paper cups at fast food restaurants. The professional football quarterback, Timothy Richard Tebow, you probably have heard him just called Tim, has been known to print the reference in his eye black underneath his, uh, his eyes uh, when he plays. And this he did most famously, I guess, in 2012 at what became known as the 316 game. Uh, when Mr. Tebow then of the Denver Broncos threw a ball total of 316 yards in a playoff upset against the Pittsburgh Steelers, and they won the game 29 to 23. So then immediately after that happened, John 316 became the most Googled search in the United States at that time. Even you'd think everybody would know John 3.16, but clearly there are a lot of people who are curious as to what that passage of Scripture spoke about. On Amazon.com today, you can find numerous books, some of them entitled The 316 Promise, and another one called 316, The Numbers of Hope. People seem to be really fixated with John 3.16, and there's no wonder. The verse has caught attention of sports fans, casual readers, theologians alike. Martin Luther famously called it the gospel in miniature, indicating that it is the very heart of our Christian faith, the words that are penned there. It says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him may not perish but have eternal life. The very heart of our faith, friends, that God loves the world. The giving part of his son will resonate with parents who sacrifice for their children, with soldiers who sacrifice for their country, and with anybody who sacrifices anything out of love for anyone else. And the idea that everybody may have eternal life, well, that's the basic Christian hope, right? This too will make sense in other contexts. For those of you that are here this morning who are parents, what of you? Do not want anything but the best for your children, right? You want the absolute best. I often hear parents say, I wanted them to have better than what I had growing up. That's our hope and prayer is that they'll have better and more and better experiences in life than we did, that they might learn from our lives and mistakes made. 
And eternal life is the very best that God has to offer to His children. The sacrifice, the giving of one's best, they're all based on one simple thing, and that is God's love for each one of us. When you think about it, God's love for the world is nothing short of miraculous, isn't it? God created the world, of course, so that accounts for some of it. We tend to like the things that we created. A number of years ago, a friend of me, a friend of mine convinced me to go with them to a painting class. I never painted anything in my life. I was lucky to be able to draw the uh, stick figures uh, right when we played hangman in, in, in grade school. But so I'm not an artist by any means. But I said, well, this could be fun, and it, with the money that you paid to, to have the lessons talk to you, we're going to help that churches. It was taught at the church. We're going to help their youth mission that summer. I said this probably been ten years ago, but the lady was a professional painter, and she knew she knew how to teach. She knew how to teach even beginners and novices like me. And she took uh, you brought your own photograph, what you wanted to paint, and you started off with your canvas. And she had you hold the, paint, the photograph up and you divided your canvas off. You broke it down into little bits and pieces. I always thought when you started painting, well, here we go. And you just stick it there. But you don't. You do it in quadrants. At least that's the way she taught us. Made it a whole lot easier. So I started in this corner and then I looked at the picture and I went over here and sketched it out with charcoal. And as time goes on, not to belabor this, but it wound up being something that I was actually pretty proud of, believe it or not, when we got done. Now, she may have walked around behind me once or twice and grabbed the brush and fixed a couple of things, but it still turned out pretty good, and I probably did 90% of the work. So I actually framed it and have it hanging in my kitchen at home. And so when we create something, we're normally pretty proud of it, aren't we? Whether it's a craft or whether we sit down at an instrument and play a tune that we've been working on, or whether we have a project in our home or grow flowers or bake a cake or a meal, if we're worth doing and we're pleased with it, we're proud of it. But we humans have such a rebellious nature about us, don't we? Sometimes we ignore God's plan, the, the instructions He's trying to give us for life. We ignore those. We bargain with Him. We fight against His justice, at least some of the time. And Martin Luther also once said, If I were as our Lord God, these vile people were as disobedient as they are now to me, I would knock the world in pieces. Now, how many times have we heard somebody say, or maybe even we ourselves have said, I don't understand why God just doesn't strike them down. We get frustrated with a person. We get frustrated with a group of people. We get frustrated with a situation that's going on. And we want instant vengeance. But doesn't the Bible say vengeance is mine? saith the Lord. I always enjoyed watching the episodes back in the day and now they're all reruns of Sanford and the Son. And one that sticks in my mind was when one of the few times when Fred and Esther were on the same team. I forget the exact details. They don't come to mind. But they were both mad at somebody who I think had tried to swindle them. And so... Fred was the one that turned the corner. You know, Esther was always thumping the Bible and preaching God's Word, and Fred was turning against her most of the time. But at that time, Fred said, uh, no, Esther, he said, she was going to go after the guy. He said, no, Esther, he said, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. And Esther looked at him for a minute, and she had that pocketbook, you know, she always carried that pocketbook. She said, vengeance might be mine, saith the Lord. She said, but I can't wait. And she broke free from his grip. Chase the guy out the window, out the window, I think, with the pocketbook. So, yeah, we get that thought about us as human beings. We want it to be, we want the score to be settled right now, don't we? We want vengeance now. And sometimes we think in our minds that God would do just that. Knock the world in pieces. Knock the terrorists in pieces. Knock Congress in pieces. Knock whatever in pieces. You fill in the blank. And that's not all. Each one of us is quite capable of doing the most terrible sorts of things, and sometimes we do. We trespass against God. We commit offenses. We sin. After all, who among us has not done what we ought to have done or left undone what we ought to do? Who has not from time to time denied God's goodness in others, in ourselves, or the world around us? 
but you know in the person of Jesus Christ we find a God who's not much interested in bringing retributive justice not so much worried about punishing offenders not much interested in picking out a penalty for wrongdoers we find a God who seeks to forgive who seeks to restore relationships that's his priority he wants to repair the hurt that was caused by something bad happening, not cause another one. And that too arises out of our main theme for today. God's love to us. God's love to the entire world. God loves us too much to cause us to cower in fear. God loves us too much to cause us internal punishment. God loves us too much to make us suffer or suffer any more than we already do. And that's good news for us. It's good news for Christianity. And it's good news for all the world, really. Because God loves us. I'm so thankful that He loves me, aren't you? Amen. Because I'm so unlovable at times. In Romans 6.23, the Apostle Paul addresses this. He says, so should we continue in sin that His grace may abound. So basically what He's saying, knowing that God is so loving and is going to keep on forgiving us, if once something is brought to light to us, should we keep on doing that thing? Because, well, we're going to get a free pass anyway. He said and ended that phrase with, God forbid. That doesn't mean that when we cause offense, we'll be forgiven by God, but we may also have to pay the earthly penalty for our actions. When we do things we know are wrong, irresponsible and dangerous, we can pray for God's forgiveness and He'll give that, but we can also expect that our society that we've built around us will demand payment of a penalty. And as Christian citizens of a democratic nation, we should be prepared to pay that price, make the necessary apology to restore what was taken to the very community in which we live and have harmed. I was reading an article the other day about an anthropologist who was teaching a college class and she asked the students, she said, does anybody know in an anthropological dig how we can tell when civilization kind of started? And so they had all kinds of answers, but you're not going to believe what she said. She said, it was when we found the first femur bone, that's your leg bone, one of them, that was broken and healed. And the class thought for a minute, what would that have to do with the start of a civilization? She said, if you find a broken femur bone and it's not healed, it means that person, way back then, before medicine, doctors, or anything, died right where they broke their leg or didn't get very far. They couldn't get water. They couldn't get help of any kind, no food, and they basically at that point would have laid there and become food for animals. But she said, when we found the first femur bones that were healed, it meant that someone else came along and took care of that person, got them up from that spot, helped to heal them, even if they didn't know what they were doing. Maybe it was the very first man in the world that ever broke their leg. Didn't know what they were doing at all. Someone, you can tell, cared for that person, brought them food, brought them water, and kept them safe until they could be healed to walk again on their own. Someone loved someone. We have a lot of broken femur bones in our lives, but God loves us and He cares for us. So, our job as Christians is to first recognize that God loves each and every one of us and to know how much He loves us. When we truly appreciate that, then we take responsibility for our actions and then we seek healing for those against whom we have transgressed. We pray it every week. Forgive us our trespasses or our sins, some of the versions of the Lord's Prayer say, as we forgive those who trespass or sin against us. It's an even exchange. We admit we've done wrong and we strive to do better. 
One of the favorite phrases of mine that's popped up here lately is when you know better, do better. Maybe you're unaware. Maybe we're ignorant of certain things in our society. But once we learn that that is wrong, let us do better. We strive then to be the very image of God in which we're all created by loving others just the way God loved us. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that everyone who believes in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. So this week, let us strive extra hard to make it so by seeking not punishment for those who have wronged us, but reconciliation by sacrificing for others and loving them a lovable lot that we are as best as we are able. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your abounding love to us all. Love that knows no limits, no boundaries. We fail you multiple times each day. I can speak from personal experience here. I've always said each time I climb in the pulpit, I would never point out anything against anyone else but what I didn't admit that I do the same things myself. None of us are perfect. No, not one. Sometimes we fail you intentionally and sometimes it's unintentional. But you're always ready to forgive and to forget. You said in your word that you remove us from our sins as far as the east from the west. We're so undeserving of that kind of love but we praise you and we give you eternal thanks for it. And I thank you that we have a church full of people who strive to do that each and every day here at First Venice. And to this we say, Lord, hear our prayers. God, we want to pray today for the healing of those who were mentioned during our prayer time and sharing, both near and far. We pray for those, Father, who are suffering the effects of the COVID virus. We pray for their health. We pray for those who have other illnesses and ask, Lord, that you'd be with their doctors, their nurses, all their caregivers. We pray, Father, for those who are less fortunate than we out in the world. May we do what we can to help prevent homelessness and hunger. May we be a friend to those who are lonely, widowed, and orphaned. For those who are seeking justice, may we fight on their behalf. For all these things you've instructed us in your holy word, that when we do these things, we are also doing it for you. We continue to lift up our leaders at all levels of government, not only here in our nation, but around the world. Speak to their hearts. Fill them with the words that you would have them to hear. We pray for our president, our representatives in Congress, our governor, all of our state representatives here in the Commonwealth of Virginia. We pray for Mayor Bradley Gross here in the town of Vinton and all of our council members. Praying again for all of our doctors, nurses, caregivers, law enforcement, EMT, firefighters, and we humbly ask that you keep us all safe and healthy in the week ahead. Continue to be with the safe rollout of the COVID vaccine as well. And to this we say, Lord, hear our prayers. God, we pray for your church here on earth. That is us. It is not this building. It is not any building with the church on the name of the sign in front of it, but it is the people who gather there. Help us to reflect and think upon that this week. Know that when we are out and about in the world that we are sharing your love, we're ambassadors of your strength and courage to share with others, to help them fight the foe. We remember especially Terry, our general minister and president, continuing to lift up Bill, our regional minister in Virginia, and his son Tristan, as he continues with his cancer treatments. We lift up our deacons, deaconesses, and elders here at First Church and all the work that they do. And for each one of our members and friends who go out into the world and share your love. To this we say, Lord, hear our prayers. Lord, now as we close this service as we do each week, we're going to sing a hymn. And as we sing, Father, we pray that if there be anything on anyone's heart or mind here that they need to share, that they would either do so during the singing of the hymn or that they would let me know after service that I might pray with them, let them know that they are among friends and we're here to help one another. 
May decisions now of everlasting importance be made and hearts and lives be changed. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is Amazing Grace, number 546.